So um, welcome back to the second class. Last time we just sort of had an intro um, to the course. So you can see here, uh, if you haven't opened the spreadsheet yet, it's nice to sort of follow along with, with how the course is going. So now that we've had one lecture and I know that the lecture capture works and I can download it and edit it and stuff, that's, that's really good. So um, a little bit unfortunately, they do downsize the videos to 720p. Um, because they think that saves on file space, but it, it doesn't. That's all dependent on the bit rate. So I was like, hey, can you keep the bit rate the same, but convert it to 1080? And they were like, no, we don't know how to do that. So um, they're not going to change the whole thing just for me. So uh, that's fine. Um, it still works. I think it's legible. Most people in the survey said it, the quality was good enough. So here you can see that the slides are linked, the D2L video is linked, and the YouTube video is linked. Um, and today and Thursday's class are going to be on C++. And so last time I offered this course, it was an online offering. So if I wanted to, say, do some live programming after the normal lecture, I had all the time in the world to do that, and you could choose to watch it or not. And so what today typically is, well, when I offered it online, there's a bunch of lecture slides about C++, and then I do some live programming. But when I loaded up last year's lecture, it was almost two and a half hours long. Um, so I definitely can't do that in, in this class. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give the slides in class today, and then I'm going to take the live programming section from the last offering, and I'm going to put it at the end of this lecture, and then I'll upload that. So it's completely optional, but in case you do want to see some C++ programming from scratch, um, I do some things like file reading, making a class, um, uh, functions on classes, function, like making different functions, stuff like that. So if you're very, very new to C++, it's probably helpful. So the second half, you'll see the difference, obviously. One, I'll be sitting here. Another one, I'll be lecturing from home. But um, you'll have that available to you if you want. And the same thing will go for the next lecture as well. So uh, I, on, over the weekend, I can't remember exactly when I released it, uh, probably yesterday. Um, but I put out this survey, just some things about the in-class lectures, and I always like to go over the results of the survey. This is not complete yet, only like 15 or 16, pe or 16 people have completed it, but uh, just some questions. So for example, given that lectures will be, uh, videos will be posted, how many in-class lectures do you plan on attending? I, I still recommend everyone show up to the lectures. You know, your opportunity to ask me questions like while we're going and stuff is, is really nice. Um, how would you prefer to watch the lectures? So it's about a um, three to one ratio, YouTube to D2L. Doesn't matter to me how you plan on watching them. Um, a lot of people said that the lecture videos are very important. Um, I think that's true. I think it's a great uh, thing to be able to watch things back if you didn't quite uh, get it in class. Uh, nobody's saying don't post the lectures to YouTube, so that's cool. I'll keep posting them there. Um, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to make them public. I, I have a previous, a previous version of the course that's already there in public. Um, and those video the videos themselves are better quality, so maybe I'll just leave that public and leave this course unlisted for now. Um, so people said it was between medium and high quality for the first lecture. I agree. Uh, not great, not terrible. Um, so we'll, we'll keep doing that. And I did the thing where I sort of edited myself into the corner. I just asked about that because it's like a minute or two of work to do that. So uh, a few people like to have it there. Um, so I'll, I'll just keep doing that. It's not too much work. And then there was not really um, a whole lot of uh, feedback, just like why people chose the answers that they did. So yeah, I do like to go over those things because like your feedback, it does matter. And if there's like, hey, don't ever do this, and the class really wants it, then I I don't do that, right? Because it's all about, it's not about me. It's about what, how, how you learn and, and what helps you um, know the stuff. So let's just hop into the lecture. All right, so C++ is obviously the language that we're going to be using for the course. And as I said last time, many, many people have gone through the course without knowing any C++ and have been absolutely fine. So who here has at least written a Hello World C++ program and compiled it and run it? OK, that's great. So everyone here, or almost everyone, has done that. Um, we are going to go a little bit deeper into C++, but this is certainly not a C++ course, right? 
And for all of the assignments that I'm going to be giving you, I'm going to be giving you like the skeleton code, and you're just filling in the skeleton code, right? So you're going to be given for each assignment uh, a few different files. Assignment one, I think, is just one file, um, besides the like the make file or the project files. Um, so all of that architecture of the assignment is already done for you, and you just have to fill in the code that's missing that actually does the game playing stuff. So there's a few great references that I, I like to point out. Um, LearnCPP.com, there's a step-by-step -step tutorial if you need a little bit of extra help with C++. Um, CPP reference, this is the site that will pretty much always show up as the first Google result if you're like uh, reading files in C++ or how to add to a vector in C++. It'll usually come up as the um, CPP reference. And then there's another um, tutorial here at uh, c++.com, and of course there's also lots of great YouTube um, videos and these lectures as well um, for a little bit of extra help with C++. <clears throat> so what is C++? Well, it's a programming language, and in my opinion, it focuses on features that allow it to run really fast, if you do it correctly, um, and also have a lot of functionality, almost to its detriment. Um, one of the one of the downsides, actually I have a slide on the downsides of uh, the pros and cons of C++, so I'll wait till then. But it does focus on the ability to run really fast while also having lots of functionality. It's a compiled language, and it compiles to a binary. So unlike something like Java, which compiles to byte code, which is run by a, a virtual machine, C++ is actually compiled to the machine code that runs on a particular machine. So if you have um, C++ code, some, if you write just standard C++ code without a bunch of different libraries and stuff, that, that will be able to be compiled on like 32-bit Windows, 64-bit ARM, uh, your Mac M2. The same code, for this course at least, will work on pretty much your toaster as long as there's a compiler out for it, right? And so that compiler, which is written for that specific operating system and that specific CPU architecture, will take the same code and translate it to the code of each of those machines, right? Um, but once you have a binary, you can't just take, for example, the binary that you compile to Linux and run it on Windows. That won't work. Uh, C++ is statically typed, meaning that all of the, um, the types of your variables, so if you have an integer or a float or a string or a class or whatever, all of that has to be known at compile time. Okay? There are no dynamic types in C++. Uh, and C++, a lot of people would say that C++ is a low-level language. I would say it's a mid-level programming language because assembly is a low-level language. C++ certainly offers a lot more functionality than assembly. Um, C, uh, C, which is very closely related to C++, is a lower-level programming language than C++. Um, but a high-level language here would be something like Python. Right? You can write Python that almost looks like English. Right? So, Definitely a lower level programming uh, language than Python, but a higher level uh, programming language than assembly. But if you want to write assembly in a C++ file, you can. Right? So you can get as low level language as you want with C++. We're not going to be doing that in this course, but it is a possibility. And one of the great things about C++ is that you can compile your code, then you can look at the assembly of that code to see, oh wow, the compiler did something really strange here. Let me kind of unroll that or put it in manually to, to get the exact speed up that I was looking for. And so, you know, there's a lot of memes about C++ and how difficult it is to learn and how difficult it is to use and stuff, but that's not so true anymore, right? If you teach C++ from sort of a top-down way, it really doesn't look any different from something like Java, at least for most of the functionality, right? So it's a pretty, it's a pretty nice programming language if you stick with modern usage of C++. Um, here's another video. You know, you have all these videos out there like learn C++ in one video, but it's like a few years long, right? And um, what I think about C++ is like right now is the highest you'll ever rate yourself at C++. It's, it's a weird thing where the more you learn, the more you learn that you don't know, and you just feel worse and worse and worse about it. Like, I've been using C++ for like 15 years, and I legitimately think I know less than I did when I started. Like, there's just so much to learn about it. But there's not much we need to learn to be successful in this course or to write games with C++. There's just a lot to the language. Um, and so, you know, this is another one. 
first year of C++, you kind of shoot yourself in the foot a little bit. But by the time you go on, you're so confident that when you do shoot yourself in the foot, you blow the whole thing off, right? OK. So some of the advantages of C++ that we will be taking advantage of this year, it is very widely used and very widely supported. You'll always be able to find an answer to your C++ question. And it's so widely supported that so far, in all the offerings of this course, the same code runs on 32-bit windows, 64-bit windows, um, any Mac that I've seen, any Linux distribution that I've seen, you should be fine. The only difference is, when you go to download the library for SFML, you just have to make sure you choose the 64-bit version or the 32-bit version, whichever operating system you're using. Um, I don't think anyone would still be using a 32-bit operating system at this point, and so we'll just be using the 64-bit version of everything for this course. Okay, Just easier um, to make it all one version. If you happen to be using a 32-bit version of Windows, for example, you could just download that, li that like the 32-bit version of the library, but please upgrade your computer. Um, there are many, many libraries available for C++. Whatever you want to do, you can do it in C++. Um, but we will only be using two libraries. By libraries, I mean external libraries. There's this thing called the standard template library in C++, which gives you things like vectors, files, input, output, all that kind of stuff. But in terms of external libraries, we'll just be using SFML, which is a simple, fast multimedia library. And we'll be using IMGUI, which is the immediate mode GUI library that'll give us, um, I showed last time, an example of a user interface. The resulting code is very fast if you write it correctly. Okay? The resulting code, now here's, a, here's a, a hot take. If you just naively write some bad C++, and you naively write some bad Java, the Java will be faster. Because Java passes by reference by default. C++ passes by value by default. So if you're just passing around vectors without declaring them as pointers or references in C++, you're actually like copying whole vectors. You're copying whole strings. And like that is very difficult to do in other languages. right? So Bad C++ is very slow. Good C++ is very fast. All right. The syntax is very similar to Java and other languages um, in terms of how it declares classes, functions, uh, for loops, all that kind of stuff. The code is very, very, very similar. Um, C++ programmers get hired. There are lots of companies looking for C++ programmers, so that's an advantage. Um, the code is highly customizable, meaning that you can like overload operators and do all sorts of crazy stuff, but that is also a disadvantage. Okay, So like one of the very um, true criticisms of C++ is that if you're reading someone else's code, you're not really sure what it's doing, because somewhere else in their code, they could have defined that all that stuff does other stuff. Right? So it's, it's kind of annoying, but we're not going to be bad C++ programmers. We're going to make sure that our code does exactly what it says it's doing. And C++, I think, is not going anywhere. It's uh, going to be around for a long time. Disadvantages, it's easy to write unsafe code, and it is easy to crash. It is easy to do this in a lot of languages, but it's especially easy to do this in languages that give you access to things like raw pointers and memory where you can seg fault. Who's had a seg fault, like a true segmentation fault before? OK, so you try and dereference a null pointer. You get a seg fault. Um, welcome to C++. I'm sure you'll get at least one of those this year. Uh, you must manage your own memory, which is a big downside to a language nowadays. But as we will see as we go through the course, this is actually going to be a big upside. Because what this means, you must manage your own memory, means that you can manage your own memory. Right? And in terms of the like everyday stuff of like creating objects, creating arrays, making sure they get deleted properly, we can do that in a way that's really, really easy. And I'll get into that. That's called RAII. It's in the next lecture. And we'll use that throughout the course. The basic uh, thing about RAII, it's called resource acquisition is initialization. It's just a programming paradigm where if we have something where we have to say allocate memory, and then later we have to make sure that it's deallocated, then we can create a class. 
And in the constructor of the class, we can allocate the memory. And in the destructor of the class, we can clean up the memory. And it turns out that if you do that, it doesn't even look like you're managing your memory at all. It looks just like any other garbage collected language, except it's not garbage collected. You are the garbage people, right? <laughs> yeah. But if you're the garbage person, you can put the garbage wherever you want. It's great. Um, the syntax of C++, admittedly, can be a little bit confusing. I have read C++ code. Um, from two different students that does the exact same thing that looks completely different. And it, is, it can be confusing sometimes. Uh, it can be hard to read other people's code due to custom definitions, operator overloading, et cetera. Um, we'll get into this as, as the class goes on, and you'll see how that can get a little bit uh, confusing if not done right. And the biggest thing is that compiler and linker errors can be very difficult to interpret for first-time C++ programmers. Um, so this is like, you know, another meme about like your actual C++ experience, you know, the time you spend typing code versus the time you spend dealing with linker errors. Um, and, oh my, integers, especially zero, right? So you look at a zero, that could be an int, or a bool, or a pointer, or an array, or like <laughs> a whole bunch of different stuff can be equal to zero. And depending on the context of this, it could be one of these data structures, right? So an int could obviously be zero. A bool, if you set a bool to zero, it's false. If you set it to anything else, it's true. Uh, a pointer being zero, well, that's the null pointer, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So zero can be used for a lot of things, and that gets a little bit confusing if you're reading other people's code bases where they use zero all the time. So before we get into like more talk about C++, it's of course built on the C language, so we'll talk about C, which was created by Dennis Ritchie at Bell Labs in the 1970s. Like I said, C is on your toaster. It probably literally is. It's, it's crazy how widely supported C is. It is a procedural, um, low to mid-level programming language. There's no object-oriented programming in C in terms of you can't create a class, which then you can inherit from. There's no polymorphism, stuff like that. Um, and it's very popular for system software, drivers, embedded programming, operating systems, stuff like that. And it greatly influenced the development of C++. So the C++ programming language was created by uh, Bjorn Strusup at Bell Labs. And originally, well, the idea for C++ was, hey, C is great, but I want classes, right? And this is still kind of how people view C++ as just C with classes. But oh boy, is it a whole lot more than that. Um, it is a procedural superset of the C programming language. So a lot of people like, who are very expert at C or C++ would roll their eyes at that statement. I stand behind it. 99.9999% of C code can be written and compiled in C++. So when I say that it's a superset of C, I'm saying that most C code that you would practically write outside of some contrived exam question can actually be written in C++ and compiled and it'll work, okay? There are exceptions, but we're talking about like practically all of C is contained within C++. It is for, uh, supports object-oriented programming. Um, so you have classes, you have inheritance, you have all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, generics as well, so there are templates, so you could write a class like a vector and then you could template it so that you could store anything in it. You could have a vector of ints, a vector of bools, whatever you want. We will be making use of both of these in the class. Um, it maintains the efficiency of C. If you write the same code in C++ or C, typically it'll run in about the same amount of time. And it is very, very popular in video game development. And if you've ever used like the Unreal Engine, C++ is supported in the Unreal Engine. And C++ influenced the development of later languages such as C Sharp and Java. Versions of C++. So C++, like the first like initial public release was in 1985. Um, and then the first standardized version wasn't until the late 90s where we got C++ 98. And writing C++ 98 code, I can, I've, I've written a bunch of it in the early 2000s and I can see why people didn't like C++ because it is very verbose to do some things like setting up an iterator to go through like a data structure. It's like 40 characters of code to do something that would be very few uh, characters of code in another language. 
but we're not going to be using C++ 98 in this class. C++ 11 came along for 2011. Many, many new quality of life stuff in C++ 11. And if you're writing decent C++ code these days, you're using the features that were introduced in C++ 11. Um, there's C++ 14, 17, 20. We're going to be using C++ 20 in this course. Um, it has a lot of nice functionality over C++ 98. Um, and in order to specify which version of C++ you are using, um, you, when you compile with the compiler flag, and this, is, this will be automatically done for you in the Visual Studio project, it's just dash standard equals C++ 20. And so if you want to use one of the new features that's past C++ 98, even if it's just C++ 11, so for example, a range-based for loop, so for x in vec, something like that, and you don't put this into the compiler, it'll be like, what the hell is that? I don't know what that is. So you have to put in the newest standard. And all of the C++ is backwards compatible. So you can write C++ 98. That'll work with C++ 20 code, and you're compiling C++ 20. I think some things may be deprecated, so they're not like um, they don't want necessarily uh, suggest that you do that. But for all intents and purposes, it's backwards compatible. But backwards compatibility comes with a cost as well. Um, this is sort of how you know you've got C here, which is the ground, and then like C++ was this little house that you had, and then we just started adding things onto it. So this is one of the valid criticisms of C++ is that they keep adding stuff to the language without taking anything away from the language, right? And so there's a lot of stuff there, and you can do, you know, one thing in like four different ways, and it just, you know, whichever one you happen to learn is the one you're using, maybe it's not the most efficient. So this is definitely a valid criticism of C++ that, you know, all these new versions of the language are just kind of added onto each other instead of replacing each other, right? But if you replaced it, uh, that would be a nightmare as well, right? Because you'd have old C++ code that you couldn't compile with a new compiler, or blah, blah, blah. So it is a valid criticism, but we're going to hopefully avoid any of these pitfalls. Some of the properties of C++, uh, it is statically typed. Oh, I already said this, but anyway, uh, we have to declare the type before we use it. Uh, Java and C are also statically typed. Um, something like Python is not statically typed, right? Or JavaScript. You can just declare a variable. You can set it to whatever you want whenever you want. Um, so variable types are defined at compile time. Uh, by, for example, uh, Python is dynamically typed, so we can just say num equals 10. Uh, so that's an integer. We could set it to a float. We could set it to a string. It doesn't really matter. So let me take a drink here first. Your first C++ program. Well, this is computer science, right? We've got to do the hello world example. So this will print out hello world. Um, if you've written any C++, you probably know uh, what everything here does. But if you haven't, then like this syntax, standard colon colon C out bracket bracket, like it's, it's a bit weird at first, right? So um, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you haven't studied C++. So let's go over it and see exactly what we're doing. The very first line is include IO stream. Everybody here has either included or imported a library before in some programming language, and that's exactly what this is doing. This is called a preprocessor directive. So C++, as well as many other languages, have this thing called the preprocessor, which before you actually compile anything, it looks at these hash commands and actually does something. So imports a library, for example. We'll talk a bit about the preprocessor later. Um, and it is used to include a C++ library. And this particular library, IO stream, is input output stream. And it is used for input and output streams. And so it will let us print things to the console using standard C out. And so we'll, I'll get to that line of code in a sec. So int main, int arg c, char star arg v, bracket, bracket. What the hell is that? Well, if, you've, if you have, who's, did, have you taken a course that was in Java here, or is it all Python now? OK. OK. 
So if you have used Java, this is the public static void main string args that you just had to memorize with Java on your first day, right? So this is the same thing. Um, so each uh, C++ program must have a main function, and then that is the function that gets called when your program starts, right? So whatever code you write, it starts at main. Um, the contents of the function are enclosed in curly braces, and the main function has an int return type. Uh, argc, that is the number of program arguments, meaning that whenever I run my program, and then I say, like, I can type, you know, myprogram.exe space some string, maybe a file name or something like that, or my name or some other argument, um, I can type a bunch of different arguments in. Argc is telling the program how many arguments to expect, right? Or, sorry, no, it's saying how many arguments were passed in to, to the program, not how many to expect. So, like, if, you're, if you have a program and it requires a file name to be passed in as an argument, and if argc is not the correct number, you can say, hey, you didn't type in the correct number of arguments. And then char star argv, that is an array of strings. Strings, native strings, at least in C and C++, are represented by arrays of characters. So um, a pointer to a character, next lecture will be all about pointers and stuff, so we'll, we'll leave that for now. But it is essentially Java's string args. Okay, so that's what this is. Standard C out. Um, I never know what to call this. I call it the pipe operator. So it pipes whatever's over here into that thing. Um, hello world. So this line prints the string hello world, and it's a string literal because it's encapsulated in quotation marks in the code. Um, slash n is one way of uh, printing a new line character to the terminal. Standard is a namespace. We'll talk about namespaces more later, but they're essentially just collections of code. So anything that is in the standard library, the standard template library, or the STL, which is the libraries that come with C++. So whenever you download a compiler, it will have the STL with it. All that stuff is in the standard namespace. So if I want to refer to something that's in that standard namespace, I say standard colon colon. And there happens to be an object that lives there called C out, which is if I use this operator <laughs> to pass a string into it, we'll print it to the screen. Um, this operator pipes the string to C out, and it can be used to print any base C++ type. By base type, I mean int, float, double, um, string, stuff like that. And we can also, if we make our own custom classes, we can define this operator, and then you can print your class to C out, right? So there's, there's cool stuff that can be done. Um, each C++ statement, this is a one-line statement, must end in a semicolon. And C++ is case sensitive, just like most programming languages are. Return zero. Why do we need to return in main? Because main has return type of int. If you don't have this statement, then it, the program will still compile, usually, unless you have like strict warnings on. Um, but by default, the return type is, or sorry, the return value is zero. And so you return zero if the program ran to its normal completion, did not crash, everything that it was expected to do, it did. If it didn't, if there was some sort of error, then you can return something else other than zero. And what will happen is, um, oh yeah, so the program will compile without that, but it's not recommended. And what will happen is that a lot of the times um, your terminal or other programs that call this program, they will use this to know if your program ran to completion, right? So for example, um, if I try and compile C++ code, if it doesn't compile, if there's an error in the compilation, the program might return some error code. And then my terminal will actually know if my code was compiled successfully or not. So I can do something like I have a single line of code or a single line in my terminal that says compile my code and if it ran successfully, then run my code. Right? So you can use these return codes to do a bunch of different stuff. Uh, white space in C++, for the most part, like a lot of programming languages, doesn't matter. 
If you're used to something like Python, obviously white space in Python is how all the formatting is done. But all of this stuff um, will compile in C++. The only time that it does matter, yeah, I have, I have a slide on that. Um, so you can write code like this. Um, so you know, we can have it all on one line. We can do this monstrosity, or this monstrosity, or this, which is absolutely beautiful. So in this class, we will be sticking, these are called almond style braces. Um, this is sort of a, and not everyone in the world does it this way, but a lot of C++ programmers and conventions do use almond style braces. braces. Um, most of you probably use um, K and R style braces, I think they're called, where the, the opening brace is on the same line as the function, and then the closing brace is on the next line. One of the reasons why I like this style so much is because um, you can visually line up when blocks of code begin and end. And once you start getting used to this style, it's actually kind of hard to go back to any other style. That's my personal opinion. This is a religious debate, <laughs> right? This is science versus religion. This is, as, like, this is how important this is to some people. But this is how I wrote the assignments. And the most important part of any of this is that if your company does this, you do that. Right? Because some other poor soul coming in, well, OK, if they do that, you tell them to change. But you, know, you maintain a consistent style. Right? You don't come in and say, hey, I've been using this. It's just you maintain a consistent style so all the code looks the same. Did you have a question? OK. Was it about the religion? No. <laughs> So yeah, we'll be using the um, almond style braces um, just because that's what I prefer. And I think it has objective good things about it. Now, that being said, yes, almond style is quite verbose. It takes a lot of lines of code, right? So there are a few new line characters here that technically aren't necessary. And in some cases, when I have a bunch of functions, let's say I have a class, and I have like 20 different functions that look like this. I will write the whole thing on one line. Or if you have a lambda function that's really short, I will write it on one line. So you will see in this class, 99% of stuff is like this, or it's like this. Okay? If, if, if the use case demands it, I will write it all on one line. But yeah, that's, that's just my personal preference. The only exceptions to white case, or at least the, the main exception to white case, white case, uh, white space exceptions, are that you cannot insert a uh, new line in the middle of a string literal. OK, you can't do that. If you do, you have to put a slash here to denote that, hey, take the next line of text as well. And uh, for single line comments, which are denoted by double backslash, um, you cannot put, like you can't put a new line in there because the next line of code won't be a comment. So that'll be an error as well. That is not part of the comment. Oh, I actually had a slide on this. I forgot. So C++ uh, indentation in braces. This is probably what most people are used to, K and R and their variants. We will be using almond style for this uh, particular course. C++ standard library. Uh, what is that? Also called the STL, standard template library. It's a collection of classes and functions that are available within the C++ language. So I've never met a compiler that didn't come with it. Some example functionality that you get with the STL. Um, so all of your I.O. stuff, so strings, um, input, output, streams, files. You have a bunch of containers that you can use, which are really convenient. Um, vector, set, map. We will be using a lot of vectors and a lot of maps in this course. Um, we have container functionality and functionality on different types of um, containers such as, I want to fill this container with something. I don't need to write a for loop. I can use standard fill to say, hey, from the beginning to the end, fill it with this. We also have uh, the ability to copy things, erase things from vectors, etc. We also have uh, algorithms. So, hey, I want to sort this vector based on this evaluation function. Uh, I have maximums, minimums, uh, shuffles. Random, randomization algorithms, all sorts of kinds of stuff that's available within the standard library. Um, if you go online and they talk about like really hardcore, low-level programming of games and game engines, they'll say things like, oh, if you're using a vector, 
you're dumb because there's some overhead there. It's fine for this course, right? The amount of times I've had to write my own implementation of vector to get that little bit of speed up, it, it just doesn't happen, right? Like in, in my particular case, yes, if you're using vectors to add a bunch of things and then they grow and they grow, that is very slow. We will talk later in the course about how we can avoid things like that. So we will be using the standard template library whenever it has something that we need because it's pretty good, right? And this is a balance between like ultimate super optimized efficiency and actual usability and the amount of work that you're all going to do in the course. I don't want you to have to write your own vector to start programming in the course. That's just asinine. So anything from the STL you must include in your C++ program and then it is referenced via the standard namespace. So if you want to use a vector, you would say you'd include vector. And then whenever you want to use a vector, you would say standard vector. Um, namespaces encapsulate code. So if I wanted to have a library that I wrote, I'm going to call that library Dave, because that's a great name for a library. Inside that library, I might have a variable, right? So outside of that namespace, if I want to refer to something inside the namespace, I have to say Dave colon colon IVAR. So the colon colon in C++ basically just means this thing on the right is part of the thing on the left. And you'll do the same thing for like um, classes. When you declare a function on a class, you'll do the same sort of syntax. It'll be a class colon colon function name, for example. Some common examples are standard string, standard vector, standard map. Um, and depending on where you are, where you work, which blog or Wikipedia article you read, some people will say constantly typing standard colon colon is very, very time consuming and annoying. So you should say something you can do in C++ is using standard, right? And or you can do like type defs or whatever. You can do a lot of things so that you don't have to type that. We are not going to do that. Standard colon colon is typed not that frequently, especially in this course. And by doing this, by being verbose, maybe your library, maybe you created some other string or some other vector or something. And we want to tell people, hey, we are using the standard library vector. We are using the standard library map, right? Those couple of extra characters are not the end of the world, and we're going to keep them in. We're not going to be using namespace standard in this course. If you ever do, just make sure you don't do it in a header file. We'll, we'll get into all that a bit later. So source code of C++, um, the program code is written in .cpp files. So for example, if we have a program that's really short, like our Hello World program, we would just write main.cpp, that is a convention. It does not have to be called main.cpp. It could be called dave.cpp or student.cpp. It doesn't matter as long as it has a main function inside it, okay? But by convention, the program, or sorry, the file that contains the main function, we're gonna call it main.cpp, right? Because even though we can call it whatever we want, we should stick with some conventions to make future readers of our code and the TAs and the markers actually able to read our code. In some places, um, especially years ago, you could see dot capital C or dot capital CPP. It actually doesn't matter what the extension is as long as your compiler knows, hey, this, these are the, the program source code files but we will be sticking with the convention of .cpp, lowercase cpp, for the course. And the cpp files are used for function and class definitions. There's also declarations, and we'll talk about the difference between those a bit later. Header files, so there are program files, .cpp files. Header files are written in .h files for headers. For example, uh, math.h would be a library maybe that does some math stuff. If I have written a class, I would declare that class in myclass.h, and it is used for function and class declarations. So declarations and definitions are different, and I'll show the difference between them in a little bit. The compilation process of C++, uh, most of you, I'm, so 
I'm going to give you a, a Visual Studio project file if you're using Windows. If you are using Windows, uh, I would strongly recommend using that. You could install like Clang or something or uh, MinGW if you really want to be like hurt yourself and then use the make file. It's a bit annoying, but you could do it. So you're either going to get a make file or a project file, and you're either going to type make or you're going to click run, and it's just going to work. So you don't need to know this for this course, but in order to debug some of the errors, it's nice to know how the actual process works. And of course, you want to be decent programmers, so you know what you want to know what's going on um, behind the scenes as well. So C++ programs are compiled in the end into binary executables. They could also be compiled into DLL or shared library files. We're not going to be doing that in this course, but no, binaries aren't the only end result. But at some point, a binary has to be run. Maybe that's using your DLL or something, but it's compiled to a binary. Um, that is run directly by the CPU. There's no VM um, like in Java. There's no interpreter like in Python. This results usually, if you write the same code in the same way in these three languages, the C++ code hopefully is going to run faster. But faster execution, there are always trade-offs. There's no free lunch in computer science or programming. Usually, the price you pay for faster ex execution is a bit lower level programming. Right? So in Python, you can do things in fewer lines of code, maybe, but it may not be as fast as if you did the same thing in a couple of more lines of code in C++. And there are many different C++ compilers for different operating systems. Um, so for Windows, the main ones would be Visual Studio. Um, you can download Clang. You could probably download GCC, but I think that is actually MinGW. That's like the Windows version of GCC. And then there's Clang and GCC for Mac, for Linux. Um, you can use whatever compiler you want as long as it works. By default, I think the make files are either set up to use Clang or GCC. The same code will, will work in either one. It doesn't really matter. But for Windows, just use Visual Studio. It's just way easier. And so, you know, compiling can actually take a, a little bit of time. Our programs will compile in like a couple of seconds. It's not a big deal. But if you ever want to see um, something that will like scar you for life, go download the Firefox source code and compile it. It's like you know you go eat dinner and come back and it's still not finished. So yes, large programs can take a long time to compile, but we have ways of making that shorter. So here's a diagram for the entire C++ compilation process. Um, at a glance. First, the source and header files are run through the preprocessor. So the preprocessor looks at all your directives and says, hey, um, I, I want to include this library, for example. Then the preprocessor output is run through the actual compiler itself. The object files are created. The object files are then linked together. And then the executable file is created. Okay? So this is the process that happens. I will go over these in a little bit of detail um, now. The preprocessor, what does this um, do? That's supposed to be C++. Um, so, uh, but G++ is actually the GNU C++ compiler. It's called G++, but it's a lowercase g. Um, but this is C++. So this runs all of the specific preprocessor directives. So some examples of that are to include a library, to include a specific file, uh, to define a limit, or to define, or sorry, not to define a limit, to define a macro or to define a functional macro. When I say include x, what that does is it literally copies and pastes that file wherever you made that directive. Okay? So if I say include specific file.h, if I had gone to specific file.h, control A, control C, come back, erase include specific file.h and control v that's literally what it does okay it copies and pastes it there if i say define limit 100 wherever in my code i have l i m i t typed it will do a find and replace and replace it with 100 if i had uh, another thing in my code which was called like um, uh, blimit B-L-I-M-I-T, this will still find replace, and what you'll have in your code is B100. 
right? So these defines, they are very powerful. They're used traditionally for very specific things, which we'll get to later in the course, but don't do them unless you have to, right? A really cool thing you can do to your buddies is define true false, right? And it'll literally, just wherever it sees T-R-U-E, it'll replace it with F-A-L-S-E. Like it's just, so this is where old C++ starts to become like really unreadably crazy. And these defines sort of work like functions. So I could say area um, 100, 200, and it will actually carry out this operation. And, but, but don't do that. We're not going to be doing that unless we absolutely have to, which we actually will later. But you don't do it. You look at how I did it and the very specific use case for that. All right. So the compiler. There are lots of, spa, of popular compilers. Um, Visual Studio does the same thing um, behind, the th behind the scenes. So this whole process is carried out in Visual Studio. It just kind of hides the details from you if you want them hidden. But it's still important to know the whole process and the command line steps to get everything done. Um, so let's say that we have a program that's written in myprog.cpp. We are going to compile it into an executable. So we type G++, that's what you would type if you were using the GNU C++ compiler. If it was Clang, you would type Clang. Um, other, other compilers, you would type whatever the executable is. And by default, without specifying the output name, it would produce an executable file called a.out. So if you're on Linux or you're on Mac and you know, you're used to Windows having like .exe as the executable name, it's, you don't need, like, what a file does is not dependent on its extension, right? So it could be called .dave, and it would still be an executable if you ran it, right? So by default, it says a.out. I don't know why, just whatever convention they used. But if you want to specify an actual executable name, you can say dash o myprog, OK? So then you can dot slash myprog, and it will run your program, your actual executable. Um, if you want to view the results of the preprocessor, you can do that. So if you don't want to compile your code fully, but you're like, hey, what does my code look like after the preprocessor is done? You can say G++ dash capital E myprog.c. By default, that will actually print it to the console. So if you want to capture that and save it to a file, you just pipe that into a file with the caret operator, whatever you call that thing. Um, if you want to compile it to an object file, which you probably wouldn't do if you only have a single .cpp file, you use the dash C um, flag. So this will produce an object file called myprog.o, which is an object file containing the compiled code of that file. And then if you have a project with like 50 different files in it, 50 different CPP files, typically what you'll do is you will compile each of them to their own object file. And then the last step is to link all of those object files together into a single executable file. Um, and so then the objects are linked into a single executable file. So if I say G++ O myprog, and then, so that's the executable output, and then I type a number of object files, G++ is smart enough to know, oh, they're passing in object files. What I should do now is run the linker. So this same command contains the preprocessor, the compiler, and the linker. You can do them all in one step if you want, just by saying, you know, uh, G++ myprog, that, that CPP, that'll do all three of those steps. Or you can separate them into the various steps. Now you say, why in the hell would I want to separate them into the various steps? One of those reasons is compile time, right? So let's say we have 50 different .cpp files. And at some point in the past, we have compiled them all to our object files. Well, if we make some changes and we want to recompile, if I've only changed one of those 50 files, wouldn't it be great if I could just recompile that object file, not all of the other object files, and then just link them together? And that's what happens. So make files, um, they have rules like that in place where it says, hey, if the changes, sorry, <coughs> excuse me, if the file hasn't been changed 
since the object file was last changed, then I don't need to recompile it. And so it'll only recompile the things that have changed. And that's what Visual Studio does as well. It'll say, hey, look at the object files. They are .obj files in Windows for some reason, not .o files. And then it'll say, hey, if those object files haven't changed, I don't need to recompile. So it, it helps speed up the compilation process. Um, multiple files can be combined in, um, compiled in one step. So if I say, hey, compile all of these C++ files into this program, you can just do that in one command. right? It will not generate the intermediate object files that will all just live within the compilation step. But the problem with this is that it will recompile all of those C++ files every time. Right? And linking is much faster than compiling. So typically, you want to do as much linking as possible and as little compiling as possible. So I, I kind of just explained this. I always forget that I have slides on this. What we want is to only, file, only compile files that have changed since the last time we compiled everything. Okay? So I already explained what this does. So again, uh, I'll go over this now. We take some source code. It's in, uh, this says .c, but this is, I could only find the diagram for C, not C++. So we have our source files, which are in .cpp files, our header files, which are in .h files. Those get run through the preprocessor, and we stop if there are any preprocessor errors. So a preprocessor error might be, hey, I tried to include this library. The file doesn't exist. Right? So that would stop before it even gets to the compilation step. Um, then if there are no errors, um, an expanded source file is created. That is then run through the compiler, right? That will stop if there are any compilation errors. So a compilation error might be something like, hey, you tried to reference a variable that doesn't exist, right? Then if it does compile, then the object files for each of your CPP files are created. And then um, the linker takes any libraries that you're linking in, because some libraries will come pre-compiled for you. And so, for example, um, you're going to need to, the make file does this for you, but you have to say, hey, I want to use the SFML library. So I have to include the SFML headers, but I also have to link in the SFML object files. right? So all the libraries and your object files are linked together. There can be linker errors. A linker error might be, hey, you told me you want to use this file, or sorry, this function. I couldn't find that function in any of the object files that you linked. So that is, that's an example of a linker error. And then finally, if everything goes smoothly, you get an executable file. Right? These linker errors can be the source of much frustration, because they might as well be in like a different language. They are often a blocker to people getting started with C++. However, C++ error message, messages vary by compiler. Clang historically has had a little bit nicer error messages than GCC. They can be very confusing at first. However, one actual error can cause many error messages. Okay? And what I see new C++ programmers do is they see like two pages of error messages, and they just read the bottom one, and they're like, I don't know what this error is. Well, it turns out that the top error message may be the only actual error. And then that error causes another error, which causes another error, which causes another error. Right? If you type the syntax wrong up here, then that syntax incorrectness, because white space and new lines don't have to happen, it may interpret that in some crazy way that it thinks are a bunch of errors, but is actually only one error. Just one second. So start from the top, and that error is probably the source of the rest of the errors. If you're programming in a reasonable way and writing a few lines of code and compiling to make sure it works, writing a few lines of code, compile to make sure it works, it's very likely that you actually only have one error. right? And so s solve that error until that one goes away. And if, if it didn't fix everything, then go to the top again and fix that one. Never, under any circumstances, fix the second error first, unless you're sure it's an actual error and it's not um, 
um, caused by the first one. Yep. It's worse in C++. Yeah. So yes, you're right. A lot of C++, or sorry, a lot of programming languages, the same thing. The top thing may be causing the rest, but it's just particularly egregious in, in C++. You may get pages of, especially when you start using templates, um, you may get pages of errors for like a missing whatever. Yeah, that's, that's just what I'm telling you to do here. Yeah. And because of that, please, uh, something that by fourth year should be taught to you, but has probably not been taught to you, is do not try and write the entire program before you compile it for the first time. Right? And I'll mention this when I talk about assignment one, but you may have to do four or five different things in the assignment. Do the first thing. Compile it. Run it. Test it. Make sure it works. Do the second thing, compile it, run it, test it, make sure it works. I've literally had students who just typed 300 lines of code, hit compile, and then said, I don't know what to do. And that, I guess, you know, if you do that, that's, I mean, it's kind of my fault, right? I, you, can't, you can't know something until you know something. And it's my job to help you know something. So it is my fault that that happens, unless I said it and then you didn't listen. Right, then it's your fault. But so please go iteratively with your um, with your attack at the assignments. Separation of .cpp and .h files. You might be asking yourself, why the hell would we put ourselves through that? So the C++ class code. If I have a new class, for example, this is when it's often done, but also when I write a new library, uh, we separate each class into two files: the header file with its declarations and the .cpp file with its implementation, okay, um, with, the, with the actual definitions. So a declaration says there is a function. Its return type is int. It's called sum, and it takes these parameters. But I'm not going to tell you how that function works. This is just the declaration. You're saying that exists, okay? A definition gives you the code that the function actually does. So declaration, here's what it will do. Definition, here's how it does it. Again, it's 2023. Why, why does this matter? OK, we'll get in there. Well, I'll explain. The header file contains the declarations. Declarations include the function name, the return type, the argument types, etc. And it is required by C++ to see all declarations of classes, functions, and variables before they are used. Okay? They serve several uses, useful purposes beyond just the required declarations, but we'll get into that a bit later. So let's say that I have a function like this. So I have a function somewhere in my code. In this function, I create a new instance of my class. Okay? my class C, and then I want to do something. So where have I declared my class? Where in my code have I actually written the code for that class? Well, if I wrote it down here, the C++ compiler goes from top to bottom. If it goes from top to bottom and it sees my class and it hasn't seen the definition, or sorry, the declaration of my class yet, it has no idea what my class can do. So this will actually be an error. If I write the code for my class below where I have used it, it'll create an error. Why? Well, ask the C++ people. You know, Java doesn't need this. Python doesn't need this. Many newer programming languages doesn't need this. I suspect it's just for optimization and for the, like, compile times would be even worse if it had to multi-scan things and anyway. Up here, we could define my class up here so the function would see it. So what I could do is I could type out class, my class, bracket, have my all of my code for my class in there, right? Now, I, the good thing is that I don't need to know or have seen the implementation or the definition for do something, right? That's going to be in the object file that I'll link in later. 
All I need to know are, is, will this compile? So I need the declaration. So I need to know um, the parameters that are, that are being passed in, are they correct? The return type, is that correct? And is the name correct? So it, usually, instead of wherever I want to see a class, or to, to use a class, typing the whole class definition, I type it in a header file, and I include it there. Okay, so again, this will go take my class.h, and it'll literally copy and paste it right here. And so this is the paradigm that's used in C++ and in C as well, where you have to include something, well, technically, you have to declare something before it's used. And by typing it in this file, it's a nice separation mentally of, okay, here's where I would find that code in that file, and then I've included it here for use. That's a little bit annoying, but it does come with some benefits. Um, some of the benefits, and here's a class that we will be using in this course. It's called the vec2 class. It stores an x and a y, double, and then there's a bunch of functions on that thing. Okay? What are the benefits? One of the benefits that I love about header files, and I miss in languages that don't use header files, is that it allows you to see all of the class functionality at a glance. Because all the declarations are just one line. They're very rarely longer than one line. So I can see the whole class right there, all the functions on it, and look at um, what I can do with that class. And it separates the design from the implementation. So this is the design of my class. And then the implementation of that class is in a .cpp file. And so another benefit is in compilation speed. The header files, once I've designed the class, they seldom change, right? So if you think about it, if I had to include my whole class's code when I compile, this is going to be fun. I ho hopefully that's not picked up on the video. But the, head the header files themselves very rarely change, right? The design rarely changes. But I may go in and change what the multiplication function does or what the... Um, the sign function does, or something like that. And if that's true, then all I ever have to recompile is the .cpp file. And the things that use or include this h file don't need to be recompiled unless the header file changes. OK, maybe they don't like this slide. But if I had typed all of my code and implementation in the header file, and then I wanted to change just a little bit of it, anything that includes this would also need to be recompiled, which is really disastrous for compilation times. But the drawbacks of header files, of course, having more files is annoying. More tabbing back and forth between the CPP and .h file. Um, cyclic dependencies can be hard to detect and resolve. I have not put in any cyclic dependencies in this course, so you won't have to deal with that. But in your own world, you probably will have to deal with that at some point. And what a cyclic dependency is, is that let's say you have a class, my class A, and inside that you want to store a my class B, but inside my class B you want to store a my class A. Right? So, okay, a good example, let's say I have a student class and I want to store courses that the student is taking, but in the course class I want to store the students that are taking the course. That's a cyclic dependency. And how you resolve that is a little bit annoying. I'm not going to go into it here. So again, um, you have source code files. OK, this says .hpp. Um, if you do type all of your, let's say you make a class, and you want its entire declaration and implementation to be in a single file. And it turns out, when we get into templates and generics, you have to specify templated functions in the header file. So in those cases, if I have a very highly templated class, I'm going to put it all in one file. And the naming convention that shows that the header and implementation is in a single file is .hpp. Okay? So your source code is going to be in .cpp or .hpp files. Each of these will can be compiled to an object file, and they'll all be linked into an executable. All right, so that's C++ compiling. Hopefully, you know enough now. Um, and eventually, you will be able to distinguish between, oh, this is a preprocessor error. This is a compilation error. This is a linker error. So in Microsoft Visual Studio, 
you'll see an error with like LNK will be there. That's a linker error. You know, you'll see um, MSVC, whatever, that will be a compilation error. So you'll, you'll be able to debug it in, in no time. C++ has a number of different primitive types, just like most languages that you've used, except something that may not be in a language that you've used are these longs. So a long double, a long, it's like, for example, you could have unsigned long, long int. And it's kind of hilarious to just like add more longs. But like you could have like a 128-bit integer or something like that by saying long, long. It's just, you know, all the details are here. I'm not going to go over all of them. You have arithmetic operators. Um, these are pretty much in every other programming language, except like Python doesn't like post-increment or pre-increment. You can say plus plus or minus minus to add one or take away one. You also have bitwise operators. We will get into bitwise operators in a future lecture. Um, yep. Python does not include um, these increment operators or decrement operators. You actually have to say plus equals one. You have to specify it. That was like part of their design philosophy. Like the person who made Python didn't like this. So I guess it's true. Like plus equals one isn't that many more lines of code, right? Um, pre increment and post increment will do different things, right? Uh, pre increment will increase the value before it is used, and post increment is post increment, so you'll use the value and then it will be incremented after that. Um, there are bitwise operators. We will get into that uh, a bit later in the course, so I'm not going to uh, talk about that too much until we actually use it. Um, always refer to Google when it comes to anything programming related. Like, just because I said, you know, don't use stuff from online, don't use ChatGPT, you're obviously going to be Googling stuff. You can't just, like, some things you can't know, right? Like, how do I add to the end of a vector in C++? Well, if you were a normal human being, you would say dot add, right? You wouldn't say dot push underscore back, right? <laughs> so you have to push it to the back of the vector. You can push it to the front of the vector, too. But there's just some stuff that's annoying, and it has to be looked up. That is completely fine, right? If you do use ChatGPT, like, use it for that kind of stuff. How do I add to a vector, not how do I solve this assignment? Okay? Because, again, it'll have that stink to it, and I'll be able to tell that you didn't use it. You didn't use the notes to solve your assignment. Functions in C++ work pretty much the same uh, as most languages. They are declared by return type, function name, then arguments, optional const at the end. Uh, there's, there's other things that I won't get into here. And then some logic in the function, very similar to Java. Um, you can have the same function name with different input arguments, but you cannot have two functions with the same name and arguments that differ only in return type. So I cannot have um, a function like that has the same arguments, or like let's say zero arguments. I can't have the function Dave which returns an int with no args, and a function Dave that returns a float with no args. They have to differ in, um, in parameters to differ in return type. C++ classes are very easy. I would argue the easiest of, of the languages that I have used. Um, and you just declare, let's say I want to have a point class. So I'll say class point, and then I'll open, and I'll close my class. Everything inside those parentheses is part of the class and then end it with a semicolon. Um, here, anything that is not specifically declared as private, protected, or public, hopefully you all have taken a, an object-oriented programming class and you know what each of those are. Protected is something, who's used protected before? Okay, think of, okay, so most of you, all right. Um, so anything that's not specifically declared in C++ is just private by default. So what some people do, and what you will see out there, is some people type in private to just declare private. I think that's not necessarily necessary. So I just leave these are private variables. And your public things, you say public, and then anything after that is public. Here, I have used, um, I cannot remember off the top of my head what this naming scheme is called. But any private member variable is prefixed by m underscore. What this does, even though it's extra characters, it helps a lot with mental load. 
So anywhere in your class, if you see a variable that is prefixed by m underscore, that you know that that is a private class variable. It's a member variable. And once you start naming stuff like this, other places um, don't include the m. They just have the underscore. And the underscore would be just a naming convention for this is a member variable. Um, but this is what I'm doing in the class. And I think you'll see once you start using it, oh, wow, that's actually really cool that I can tell something about the variable by the name of the variable. It helps you when you're programming. Um, the class constructor looks like this. So it takes in some, uh, some, up, some parameters. And then you set the internal variables, just like any other programming language. However, C++ has this thing called initializer lists. So in C++, before the code of the constructor is actually called, I can sort of, in place, say mx gets the value of x and my gets the value of y. Why would I ever want to do that? Because it's faster. If I do this without using initializer list, x and y are first given the value of 0. Or sorry, they're, they're given the value of nothing. If you haven't, like, it's like literally whatever's in RAM. They're, they're assigned values. And then um, this is called, which then sets them values. If you do this, then x initially just gets copied right into mx, and y gets copied right into my. Okay? And this is a little bit faster, but what it allows us to do, for example, if we had const ints here, meaning that they could never change, I cannot do something like this. I can't change the value of a const variable. But if I have a const variable, I can use an initializer list to give them the initial value. And then there's a destructor, which is, and again, this is the point class, colon, colon, the tilde point function. That is the destructor. So whenever your object goes out of scope, and we'll talk about scope in the next lecture, your destructor is called. So that's where you can do all of your cleanup for the class. Uh, we have some SDL containers that are commonly used, standard vector t. So that's a vector of type t. The only um, uh, caveat is that t must have a default constructor. If your, if your class doesn't have a default constructor, meaning a blank constructor, you cannot create a vector of those types. Um, you can have a standard set, which is an ordered set. There are unordered sets as well. If you want to use an ordered set, then you must be able to order your objects somehow. So your objects must, this, must have a less than operator defined. So when you have a standard set of integers, for example, it will store them from least to greatest, because it uses the less than operator to order those elements. And a set um, will only store unique values. So if I have a set and I add the same element to it twice, it will only store one copy of that. And then we also have maps, which, which we'll be using a lot in this course. So a map from uh, t1 to t2 will be a map from t1 to t2s. So for example, a map from strings to uh, integers, I might say like map Dave, and then the integer would be my telephone number or something like that. right? So you've all used a dictionary before. This is essentially a dictionary. So I just here have uh, some uh, standard things you would use for standard vector. So to declare a vector on the stack, we will be talking about stack versus heap, memory management stuff next time. Um, you can just declare a new blank vector just by saying standard vector int vec. You give it whatever name you want. Um, you can declare a vector with a certain number of specific values. So if I said standard int vec for 100, then it will initial, be initialized to have four 100s in it. Um, if I want to add to the back of a vector, I So officially, our time is up for the class, OK? But because this is like, I want to give you the best education possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some live coding now. So if you want to come back later, if you have another class, I completely understand if you're watching this live. Um, the cool thing about watching um, lectures that are recorded is that you can watch them at double speed. I'm not done. This is not the end of the class. I am actually going to do a bunch of live coding now. So for people who are very new to C++, I just want you to give, to give you as much information and as much teaching as possible. So what we are going to do now is we're going to do some live coding. 
And like I said before, I have not practiced this beforehand, so we'll see how this goes, okay? Um, so let's get started with some live coding. Now, I'm going to be doing this live coding in the terminal. In uh, The reason I am doing that is because it's just easier for me. I'm really used to it. And for the purposes of what I want to show you, it's, it's the best thing to do, okay? So I'm in the terminal here. I'm going to be using Vim to show you some things. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, Vim lecture 2cpp and this is going to open up a new file called lecture 2cpp and we're going to just do some coding in C++. So I realize that this lecture is long, but it's, it's for your benefit. It's, there's no textbook, so just watch this if you want to. You don't have, you don't absolutely have to keep watching, but if you're new to C++, this might be pretty fun. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna type in our, um, oh, and by the way, if you want to follow along, if you are a student at the university, um, the way that I am doing this through a terminal on Windows is I'm using a program called Putty. You can also use um, Windows Terminal. And you can SSH into our department so using your CS username and password, you can SSH to garfield.cs.mon.ca. So P-U-T-T-Y, putty. Um, and then you type in your username and password and you get this exact terminal. It has a C compiler. So you can do exactly what I'm doing from Windows if you want to practice your C++. So we are going to include IOStream and I'm typing all this from memory. So give me a little break. If I make some mistakes, we're gonna make the mistakes together and it'll be fun. All right, so I've got int main, right? I gotta type that in. I've got my int arg c, my char star arg v, and then I've got my, um, let's see here. I've got a microphone between me and my keyboard, so it's a little hard to type. So we are going to return zero. And up here, we are going to do standard c out hello, world and then I'm going to do standard ENDL. So I know we didn't do this in the slides, but it turns out annoyingly different operating systems have different new line carriage return characters. So typically you would just type a slash N, but if you just type slash N and then you open it up in Windows Notepad, there will be no new line. It's really annoying. And so what this standard ENDL is, is this compiler is built for this specific operating system. And so it will know the special end line character. So what we have to do here is I'm gonna exit out. So write quit. And then I'm gonna type G++ um, dash standard equals C++ 17. That is the standard that we are using for this course lecture2.cpp and then unfortunately my head is in the way but oh so it's just going to this is going to compile and it's going to go to a.out okay so it's compiling and now if i run dot slash that's the run a.out it's going to say hello world all right now if i wanted to compile to my own program i would say dash o oh, let me uh one second let me make a few new lines so my head isn't in the way. I would say dash O uh, lecture, lecture code or something like that, right? And it would compile it to that. And then I would say dot slash lecture code and it, it would run the same way, all right? Now, it's gonna be really tedious for me to have to exit out of Vim, retype everything every single time. So what I've done is um, I'm just gonna go back into the lecture code. I have a, a macro in Vim, which does that. So I have a macro in Vim. I just hit uh, control B is my macro. What it does is when I hit that button, it will save the file. It will compile the file. If there is an error, it will show me the error. If there is no error, it will run the program, okay? So from within Vim, if I just hit my macro, it'll It'll compile it and run it. So that's what we'll be doing from now on. But just realize that, um, you know, if you don't have that macro set up, you'll just be typing in G++, whatever. I just have that 
um, set up here. So there you go. Uh, so if I do type an error in here, so for example, if I type in clout instead of see out, and then I do that, what will happen? All right. So here is your first uh, C++ error. Um, my head's in the way, but I'm not going to move that, unfortunately. So it says in function int main, here's an error. Clout is not a member of standard because I said standard colon colon C out. And it says up here where you can't see, it says, did you mean C out? <laughs> and so it says that, right? So it suggests change clout to C out, right? So I do that. I change clout to C out. I recompile and it works. All right. So sometimes the C++ compiler is very useful. Sometimes it is not very useful. Um, all right. So let's do something a little bit uh, more complex than this. Let's uh, let's do some int variables. All right. So I've got int um, int a equals 42, int b equals 10. All right. So how would I print out some integers to the screen? Well. The cool thing is I can just type out A and then maybe a space between them and B, right? So anytime I want to type a new thing, I just pipe it back in. So everything gets piped into C out. I compile and run. I get 42 and 10. If I wanted to say do some math here, then I can say plus and put that in parentheses. And then that should print out, well, what? Okay, 52, right? Now let's say... Uh, let's erase this and let's say, all right, int age equals 39 because that is how old I am. Now let's, you know, I could do doubles and floats and all that kind of stuff. You know all about that. Let's use standard string. So strand, standard string, uh, first name, I'm going to say that that's Dave and standard string, uh, last name, that's going to be Churchill, right? Okay. Oops. I've been using, I've been programming too much uh, Python recently. So I got the single quote disease. All right. So I'm going to print out uh, first and then I'm going to print out a space and then I'm going to print out last. All right. Let's see what this says. There we go. Dave Churchill. If I want to have a string, standard string name, then I could say this is first plus a space, plus Churchill. So we can, or not first plus last, sorry. And then down here, I could just print out name because modern C++ lets us add strings together. It's pretty neat, right? We're not messing around with char, char, char star, uh, etc. cetera. Um, all right. So let's say, now here is something you're going to hear or see online, all right? You're going to see this using namespace standard. What this tells the compiler, this is, a, this is a contentious topic. What this tells the compiler is that we are going to be assuming that we're using stuff from standard. So if there's ever anything that I type that you don't recognize, assume that it comes from standard. What that means is when I have using namespace standard, I can do this. Okay. So I don't need to put standard in front of everything. People like that. People like not having to type that. If I come up here now and I erase that and I compile again, it says C out was not declared in this scope. Uh, I don't know what a string is. Oh my God, what's happening? And it's because it doesn't know that it's the standard version, right? So in this course, we are not going to be using namespace standard. I know that it's a couple of more characters to type, but I prefer it because it's more verbose and it says exactly what we're doing, okay? So we are not typing using namespace standard in this course. If you do, we'll ding you a few marks on the assignment, okay? Now what we're gonna do is let's use a data structure, okay? Let's use a vector. So how would we use a vector? Um, let me delete everything I have here. Let's say, all right, I'm going to have a standard vector of integers, 
right? A standard vector of ints, I'm going to call this uh, my, my vec. There we go. So I have declared a standard vector of integers. Now, in order to add something to a vector, I would say vec.pushback because you're pushing it to the back of the vector. Vector is a Q data structure, right? Sorry, it's a stack. I guess with push and pop, it's a stack. Ignore that. It's not a Q. It's not a stack. It's just a vector. So we're going to push back 42 vec.push uh, back. Ah. Uh, 10. We're going to do what we did before. Now, I could say standard C out vec zero, right? And then maybe a new line character. I'll be lazy and just do that. And now I'll copy and paste that and I'll say vec one. All right, now let's see what this does. Okay, so it printed the first thing in the vector and then it printed the second thing in the vector. Now you might be saying, Ooh, what if we said vec two? Because in Java, we'll get a uh, array out of bounds error for this. Let's see what happens. Uh oh. But the, the vector isn't that long. So what's happening? Here is where C++ gets very interesting. You're on your own when it comes to vectors, okay? When it comes to arrays and vectors, if you go beyond the scope of a vector, unless you're running in debug mode, you're just getting whatever happens to be in memory at that location. So be very careful when you do that. Now, if I had 30 things in my vector, I'm not going to want to have to write like an, a specific print statement for everything in the vector. So let's talk about how we go through the vector. All right. So there's, there's a few different ways to iterate through containers in C++. We could do the standard thing where we go for um, int i equals zero, i less than vec dot size i plus plus. And then we can say um, standard c out. Oh, geez, I keep typing that. Vec i and then a new line okay so let's see what happens here all right so it did work it did work but it gave us an, an a warning so there are warnings and errors let's see what the warnings said it said warning comparison of integer expressions of different signedness int and size type aka unsigned int or long unsigned int so what that warning told me is that the vector size is an unsigned integer and the integer i is a signed integer. So if you store, you know, you're all familiar, you're fourth year computer science students, there could be some error in the logic if I'm comparing signed integer and unsigned integers. So whenever I'm doing a loop through a vector, I'm going to use a size type or a size t. On different system, this, this size t is essentially a long unsigned int. However, size t is what you what is safe to use because it will, on a 32-bit system, it will be 32 bits. On a 64-bit system, it will be 64 bits. So now I can do this and there's no more warning, okay? So just a rule of thumb is whenever you're iterating through a vector, its size is going to be of type unsigned. So use unsigned, all right? Now, if I add another thing to this, of course, it's going to loop through my vector and it's going to print all three things. Okay. There's another way to do this, um, and that is a range-based for loop. So I can say for, um, now I need the type that's in my vector, right? So I'm going to say for, uh, this is int, int a in vec. standard c out a and a new line so what this does is it says for everything in the vector assign it the name of a and then i can do something with it all right so let's look at that and it did it so it printed out the first thing the first time and then the second thing the second time however let's try this now so if i delete this and I go up and I make this a float vector and I make these floats. So I'm just going to clear them as actual floats. 
Now what happens is I'm taking the vector, I'm converting everything in the vector to an integer, and then I'm printing it, right? And so be careful when you do that. So there's a really cool thing that you can do in modern C++ is the auto keyword. The auto keyword is going to say, hey, whatever type that is, make it that type. So even though it's a signed or it's a it's a statically typed language, I could either say float a equals vec one, or I could say auto a equals vec one. And what auto will do is the the square bracket operator for vector, the compiler knows it's going to be returning a float, so it just types it in there for me. Okay? So here, now what will happen is it'll actually print out the float, right? Because this says for whatever happens to be in the vector, it does type inference on that. Okay, someone just type type inference the same time I say it. So it looks up what type it should be, infers it, and does it for you, all right? Now, be very careful about this because doing it this way will copy the thing in the vector. For a floating point or an integer, this doesn't matter that much because you're just copying an int. However, if this was a big long string, okay, or if this was a big data structure, this is copying that. So I'm not going to get into this now. I'm going to get into this more in the next lecture, but we can use a reference here. Right, so we can use, okay, this is a reference, so we're just pointing to it, and so it'll produce the same result, but less copies. All right, so that, that was a bit hand wavy. We'll talk about that next time. All right, what I want to do now is let's make our first class, okay? So I know I said that if you make classes, what you should do is you should put them in their own H file and then include the H file, but that's gonna be a lot of work for me when I'm just doing it here. So let's, Let's just do it all in the one file, okay? So let's make a class called student. Class student. There, we've created a class. Tell me a language where you can make a class faster than that. People say C++ is hard. That's the easiest way to declare a class I've ever seen, okay? So um, in this class, we're gonna have some public stuff and we're gonna have some private stuff. So let's say um, the public stuff is going to be down there. The private stuff is going to be up here. So let's say we're going to have a standard string, uh, first name. Okay, so I'm just going to say first, standard, string, last. What else can a student have? Um, maybe they're going to have a student ID. Maybe that's going to be an integer, right? So int uh, ID equals uh, zero. We'll give it a default value. Okay, strings get default values on their own, but we can say, okay, um, maybe this is um, first and this is last, right? So we can give things default values within the declaration of the class, which old C++ couldn't do. Uh, maybe also we have something like float uh, average. So this is their grade average, right? So just something to uh, say, okay, that's what it is. Now I'm gonna uh, line all these up because I like I like doing that. I find it a bit more readable. So there we go. So there's our class definition. Nice use of white space, right? This is where the white space comes in. And um, even sometimes I'll do something like this where I have the type and then I'll do like this. Um, I know some people don't like this. I like this in certain situations, not in other situations, because you can see all the types in one column, all the names in another column, all the variables, like all the default values in another column. White space doesn't matter. It's just up to you how you prefer to look at things, okay? So those are the private things. Now, what's a function that we're gonna need for this? Well, we're gonna need a constructor, right? So a constructor, maybe the constructor is going to take in, let's just say that the constructor takes in everything. Actually, let's first give it a default constructor. Um, so you like to give things a default constructor just to say, okay, if I ever construct a student with no arguments, what's going to happen? And in this case, nothing's going to happen because um, 
I've already got default stuff up here. So that is what's called a default constructor. And if I just say student S, that's what it's going to be, all right? So now let's make a, a slightly better constructor. Let's say we're going to pass in a string, which is the first name. We're going to pass in a string, which is the last name, and then an int ID and a float average. Okay, that all fits on my screen. That's excellent. All right, so what are we gonna do down here? Well, let's actually use the, um, the initializer list right away. So I could type it all in the body of the constructor and then erase it, but in the interest of time, let's just use the initializer list. So our private member variable first, m underscore first, is gonna get the same value that was in first. m last is gonna get the value that was in last. And the same thing for the integers, m id is gonna get the value that was in id. And uh, m average is gonna get the value that was in average. Sometimes I like doing this. because white space doesn't matter, lines it up a bit nicer, just reducing that cognitive load, right? Sometimes you can't do that, it's okay, but that is our, um, our student constructor. We could have many different constructors in many different ways, but let's just leave it at that for now. And now, of course, we've got our data encapsulation up here and all that kind of stuff. Let's say we want um, to get the student's first name, right? So we would have, or let's, let's say we want to get their average. So I would have a function, int is what it's going to be returned. This is get average. It has no arguments to it. And what it's going to do is it's going to return the average. So if we ever wanna get the student's average, we can have get average. We're gonna have the same thing, uh, get ID return M ID right? Uh, we're going to have the same thing for uh, standard string. Uh, let's say get first and return m first. Uh, I see a bunch of people out there saying hello in the chat. Hello. We are doing our intro class on C++ and I'm doing some live coding. Get last. And here is our last name return m last. So I see a bunch of people giving me tips. Trust me, we're on a journey here. We're gonna to get to all of those things. So what we have now is we have private member variables for all the data that you would want to have as a student and then public, public functions to get all of those things. So let's make some students. All right, let's make some students. Um, all right. So here we are going to have student S1. And we are just going to use the default constructor for student S1. We're going to see what happens. Then I'm going to make uh, student S2. That student is going to be Dave. His last name is going to be Churchill. His student ID is going to be uh, one because I'm very old. And my average is going to be uh, pi because I'm very dumb, right? And we'll make one more student, call this S3. This is going to be uh, Jane uh, Doe, who's going to have a student ID of 2022 uh, 0001. So Jane registered for classes this year and their average is a 99.9 .9 because uh, Jane is a smarty pants, all right? So we've created some students. Let's compile now and see what happens. Now. It's very important to, like, you wouldn't want to write a whole program and then test it for the first time. You wanna do a little bit of functionality a little bit at a time. So now that we've written our class and we've written something to test the class, that's a good time to compile for the first time. All right, no compilation errors. That is very good. So what we could do is I could say here, standard cout um, s3 dot get last. Perfect. So what this should print out is S3, get last, that's the last name. So ideally this is gonna print out Doe. 
Perfect. Okay, so I've got a bunch of students. I've got their information in there. Now I can use it. However, it's going to get a bit tedious to print out all their stuff, right? One, like one variable at a time. So what I'm going to do here um, is I'm going to make a void function. And that void function is not going to return anything because this is going to just be called print. And I'm just going to be printing out stuff. Okay, so what am I going to print here? Let's print all of the students information. So I can say standard C out uh, M first, then a space, then M last, and then a space, and then ID, and then a space. Uh, actually, let me do this in a couple of lines so that it's not going off the side. M ID and a space, and then M average. And then I will have a new line. Perfect. So now down here, instead of using standard C out, I can say s3.print. And here we go. Jane Doe, their student number, and their average. Okay? So that's, you know, this is all standard first and second year stuff. I'm just showing you the C++ syntax for all of this. Perfect. Okay. So now let's say that I wanted to have, and this is going to be important in our course, okay? I'm going to have a const student. That means that I'm gonna set up this student object and I never want that student object to change, okay? So this looks fine. I set up a const student and then I print it out. When I go to compile this, I get an error, okay? And it says, Passing const student as this arguments discards qualifiers. Now, what the hell does that mean? It means the following. I have a const student that I am calling a function on, okay? But that function could change the student, right? So I have a student that I want to be const, but I am calling a function on it. So what I have to do is I have to declare this function as const, okay? So once I declare this function as const, now it's fine. Because this means I have a function called print that will never ever change the object. And if I try to change the object, so let's say in here I try and be sneaky, and I say m first equals uh, Joe. So if I try and change the variables of the object from within a const, object or a const function oh my god what happened right that's where c++ errors get kind of bad so but that whole thing basically just said don't try and change the 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 object from within a const function so what that means is that if i wanted to for example uh call s3.get last which is just returning the last name right I can't call that on a const because these functions are not const. So what I have to do up here is call const. So each of these functions where I'm every single function I have on a class where I am not changing the class, I should mark them as const. Okay, that's just good practice. It is called const correctness. So anywhere you have a function that is not changing the internals of the class, um, call it, as, or sorry, declare it as const so that you can use that function on const member variables. It's called const correctness. It might seem a little bit anal, but it's, it's what you wanna do. Okay, now watch this. Uh, no, I think I'll get this into the... No, I'm getting into this next lecture. So really what you want to do here is be returning references to these things. I understand this is the first lecture of C++. So if you're out there saying that, oh, he's copying strings, blah, blah, blah. I get into all of that in lecture number two. Okay, this is all just for, for show. All right, let's do one more thing before we go. Because I know I'm going long, but I'm just giving this for people who, who want the extra stuff. Let's make a course object, okay? Someone said, when would you ever want to make use of a constant instance of a class? 
use constant variables or structs? Um, nope, a lot of the time you would want to make a const class. The, um, the canonical example of when you would want to make use of a const class is as follows. Um, so let's say we want to say uh, do machine learning, okay? I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but I want to I want to show a good example of this. So let's say we want to do do some machine learning with a, an object called data, and that data is really big. Okay, so this is my data. What I want to do is if I just pass in data, and again I'm doing this in the next lecture. C and C++ are passed by value, so I would be copying this huge data structure here, right? So what I want to do is either pass it by a reference or by a pointer, right? Typically by a reference, because it's a little bit safer. And then since that's a reference, I actually don't want this function to be able to change my data. I just want it to do the learning on the data, right? So I want to mark that as const so that I am 100% sure that this function will not change the input variable. Right? And so in this case, if I have a const reference to data and I call data.getValue, right? If getValue is not marked as const, then I won't be able to do that. So there are lots of examples of, of where we need to access const data, okay? Or const, um, const classes. And that will come up many, many times in this course, and I'll get back into that. All right. So enough, enough of that. Let me get on with what I wanted to do for the rest of this course. Jeez. Okay. So let's make a, now we're going to make a class called course. What is that course going to, to have? Well, the course is going to have a standard string and that is going to be the name of the course. Um, we're just going to call it course by default so that we, you know, it doesn't have a name. Um, and we're also going to have a standard vector of student objects called M students. So that is going to be the context of our course. It's going to have a name, comp4300. It's going to have a list of students in, in that. Okay. Um, so for people asking out there that they didn't get that data example, tune into the next lecture and you will see it. Or look at the rest of the class when we want to, for example, draw a sprite. That sprite is going to be a class and we're not gonna to wanna to change it, so we're gonna want it to be const. You'll have to trust me that there are countless examples of where that is useful. All right, so back to the, back to the last thing I wanna do. Um, so as public for the course, we're of course going to have a course private constructor, or sorry, uh, a, a default constructor. And we're also going to have a course which takes a standard string name as a constructor, right? The course is going to have a name and we are going to use an initializer list to say that the name of the course is going to get the value of name. Now, again, I know I should be passing these by references. We're gonna talk about that in the next class. All right. But let's just talk about it now, okay? Strings are big things, okay? There are very few, if ever, any examples where this would be correct. Because again, what this would be doing in C++ is copying the string name into this constructor. So what we want to do is pass a reference to a string. We'll talk about references next time. And then because it's now a reference, we could actually change the name, which we don't want to happen. And so we want to pass a const reference to that, okay? so. A lot of the time, whenever you're passing strings around in C++, you want to pass const references to strings and not strings themselves. So this is going to be more correct. Okie dokie. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have um, a, well, we want a way to add students to the class, right? So let's do a void add student. And then we will add a student S into the class. All right. And again, we don't want to copy this student. So for just now, I'm going to say we are going to be passing a const reference to a student, which you will understand in the next lecture. So I know that like people teach C++ in different ways. 
Some people would say, don't, don't write something on the screen that they don't understand. I'm not, a, you can, you can drive a car before you know how a car works, right? So we're just going to write this for now. And then next class, we're going to explain what it means. And how would I add that? Well, I'm going to add that to my students vector by saying push back S. All right. So now that student will be added to my students vector. All right. How would I get my students? Well, um, I'm going to write a function that gets the students. Well, what am I going to be returning in that function? Standard vector, student. So that's the return type of the function get students, which has no argument, which is const because we're not changing anything. Up here, add student is not const because we cannot add students. Right? Or sorry, um, we can't add anything if it was const. And since we want to add things, it's not const. This here is going to return um, the students array. Done. However, again, C++ is passed by value. So the return type would actually copy this big vector of students. So what we want to do again is return a reference to it. And since we don't want it to change, then this is going to be const. So this is one of the annoying things about C++ is that const can appear in three different places. At the beginning of a function, at the end of a function, and at the beginning of a variable. So this const means that this function will not change the class. This const means that whatever we're returning cannot be changed. That's what that means, okay? Const correctness is important. And we'll see why once we get into the course. All right, so now we've got a way to add students and we've got a way to get students. Now what we're going to do is let's add a way, let, let's make another print function. So let's uh, say void print. This is going to be const because we don't want the, the class to change. We're just accessing values and printing them. And what we can do is let's use that range-based for loop. So for auto, or auto s in m students. So we know what that means now. It says use type inference. This is actually a student, right? So I, can, I could say for student s in students, but it's a good idea to use auto where we can. So for every student s in the students array, let's use the print function of the students. And I guess I should, you know, let's go const auto s so that it's not going to be changed. Um, for every student in the vector, let's print it out. All right, let's see, do I compile? I do not compile. Oh, I, cause I had this uh, example here somewhere. Where do I have that? Probably down here. We'll find it in a second. Oh yeah, so this doesn't work anymore. Um, all right, so now what I wanna do Someone said it looks like I can paste const anywhere. I know. Um, so people out there are asking what the ampersand is. That is called a reference. And I am very briefly explaining it here, but I am going to explain it in excruciating detail in the next lecture. So please tune in to lecture three, which is the second part of C++. We'll be talking about pointers and references in memory. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's create a course. So now I have a course. Let's call that course comp 4300. We're going to um, have a name, which is comp 4300. And what I'm going to do is say comp 4300.add student. And that's going to be student S1. And then I can copy and paste this. And I'm going to add student S2, student S3. And watch this. I can actually do this as well dot add student and then let me make a new student here and this student is uh billy their last name is bob uh their student name is three or their student id is three and their average is uh 50. boom all right now down here comp 4300 dot print hopefully this works Oh, I've got an error. Okay. So I've got mstudent.pushbackS. Okay. So it says mstudent was not declared in this scope. 
That is on uh, line 68. So let's look at nine, line 68. Um, in, I can type this, go to line 68. Oh, that's supposed to be M students. So you all failed. It was, you were supposed to catch that error. I did that on purpose, right? Okay, let's try and compile again. Okay, uh, again, we've got M student on line 63. So here we go. Oh, there we go. And it worked. So we created some student objects. We added some student objects to our course object. And now we have this, this functional system in C++ in just a few lines of code. Like, could you reasonably write that in any other programming language as quickly? I mean, you couldn't do it faster, probably. All right, so let's do something interesting. For the last thing I want to do in this course is I want to show you file input, okay? Because we're only using that a lot in this course, so you can use that. Uh, I want to add a function to my course which loads student information from file, okay? Um, I would recommend students in the class to not take a lot of advice from chat because sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong. I will eventually get to it. All right. So let's make this function load from file. We're going to have a standard string uh, file name. And this function is not const because we are going to be loading the class from a file. Okay. So. In order to do this, the first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to include the tools to let us work with a file. And that is the file stream tools. All right. So let's do that. Sorry, I just have to close this notification over here. All righty. The second thing I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to have a list of students in the class. I've already made one of those. So if I just cat students.txt, here we go. So I've got a bunch of uh, students in the same format in this file that I've already written, all right? So first name, last name, student ID, average. And then we go to the next line and we do student, last name, ID, average. And you might say, oh my God, I've heard of file reading in C and C++. It's so annoying. It's so verbose. Just watch, just, just you watch. I will challenge anyone to do what I'm about to do in any other programming language in fewer lines of code. Okay. It'll without writing libraries and then calling that, you know, so that is my student data. It's in a file called students.txt. And that is what I am going to read. So down here, what I'm going to have in my um, main function, instead of declaring all these students is I'm going to have, all right, so I'm going to have my uh, course. Uh, I'm going to call that course C. That is going to be comp 4300. And then I'm going to C dot load from file. And that's going to be students dot text. All right, let's compile and run. Okay, there's no compiler errors, but it doesn't do anything because our load from file thing doesn't happen yet, right? Oh, now, sorry, actually I didn't print. So C dot print. That's going to print all the students in the course. And again, we haven't actually loaded anything yet, so it won't print anything. But we know our printing function works because we tested it before, right? All right, so how will we load from file? Well, it turns out that in order to load something from a file, we need a file input stream. So streams in C++ are so nice. They do things for us really, really easily. So watch this, standard because the input file stream class is within the namespace standard. It's an IF stream, which stands for input file stream. I'm going to call this variable fin for file in, and then the constructor, I give it the file name. Bam. Look at that. That's crazy. Now watch this. While um, okay, sorry. Let's say I want to read all of the string tokens from a file. How would I, uh, oh, sorry. 
sorry, someone pointed that out. Someone's paying attention. Great job. So let's say I want to load in all of the different string tokens from a file and just print them to the stream, print them to the screen, sorry. So what I can do, I'm going to have a standard string. I'm going to call this temp, okay? So this is my temporary variable that I'm going to read things into. And I'm going to say while f in temp. So remember when we had standard c out? So standard c out was the opposite direction. We are using a stream, right? So this string is getting sent into standard c out. If we do the opposite thing, we can read data, even from files. So f in is going to send its next string token into temp. Watch this. And if there are no more tokens, this loop will no longer run and it will exit. So let's say while f in to temp standard c out temp and then a new line. So it's just going through the file, reading everything and printing it out. Look at that. So every individual token. So some people are asking, what is a token? Tokens can mean different things, but essentially a token is a string that is separated by some white space or by new lines. Okay. So in C++, I can get the next token by just using this operator. This just says, get the next string that's not white space and it's not a new line character and put it into temp for me. Super crazy cool. All right. Now, I'm going to need some things in order to read in the first name, the last name, uh, the ID, and the grade of a student, right? So let's say instead of temp, I have the first name and the last name. So I've got two strings now. One is called first, one is called last. And then I'm going to have an int called ID. And I'm going to have a float called average. So now what happens is, I can say while, so what is my while loop here? Well, the first name is the first thing on a line, right? So I can say while I have a valid first name as the next token, what I can do is, okay, now my first name is stored in first, all right? I can say f in, so read the next token, which is the last name into last read the next token into ID, the next token will automatically be converted into an integer for me. It's crazy how cool that is, right? So like the C++ file reading stream will automatically convert it into an int. Now, if it's not an int, it'll throw an error. And then the last one will con will send it to the float, or sorry, not to float, to average. So on each line, it says, while I have a valid first line character, read in the first read in the first name then read in the last name read in the id read in the average I, that's pretty quick but not only that remember when we had um standard c out uh hello and then we can give it another thing and then we can give it another thing like this we can do the same thing with the input version so i can say f in Sorry, fixing my white space. F in last ID average. So this literally reads in everything for me. And if this is true, now I can create my student object, right? So let me create it in place. So I'm already in my, my, my course class because it's been a while. Let's look at that. We're inside our course class. So what do I want to do with this information now that I have it. Well, I want to add student, sorry, add student. And now I've successfully read everything in. So I can just read in first, uh, sorry, I need to construct the student. First, last, ID, average. That's it. This is the entire function that loads all of those students from the file stops at the end of the file, converts everything to integers and floats. Show me another programming language that could do that that easy. Seriously. 
right? People make fun of C++, but there it is. I loaded all of that information from the file, stored it in the student class, and then printed it out. Someone said Python, I challenge you to write that in fewer lines of code in Python. Just go do it. Go do it. it. You will not be able to, like, you'd probably do it in the exact same amount of lines, right? But not fewer. Uh, all right. So, here we go. We have created a course, loaded the data from a file, printed that data out. In this course, every single game that we make is going to have a configuration file in which, if I load that, So the configuration file for all of our games in this course are going to look something like this. And so you've got to write the code to be able to parse in that stuff. And so what you're going to do is you're going to write code kind of like this. All right, where you say, okay, I'm going to parse something in and I'm going to do something with that. So feel free to just copy and paste this and, and use that for your, for your classwork. All right, I know I went like an hour over time for this lecture, but again, it was like, I don't have a textbook, so I just wanna give you this supplemental material. This is all just me helping you out with C++, so I hope you didn't mind too much. Um, uh, someone asked, Python has fewer lines for general stuff, but it's complicated things like making games C++ is better. No, 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 it's not like that where one is better than the other. The only thing I was trying to say was that People are generally afraid of using C++ because they think things are too difficult. What I'm telling you is that modern C++ is very, very concise and very powerful for certain things that we're going to be using in this course. So don't be afraid of it. This was two lines, sorry, three lines for reading in the whole file and adding the students, okay? I will put this code on D2L so students can access it. If you are not a student in the class, just, just watch it and type it out yourself, okay? So thank you so much for tuning in, um, for tuning into the lecture. I know this one went late, but I hope you appreciate the C++.